I'm Larry Wagner, and this is my take on global warming. It's based on the highly unlikely premise that I discovered a very elementary rule in physics that somehow has gone undiscovered until now. But when you apply this rule of physics to the theory of relativity, it becomes very easy to see that global warming is actually a naturally reoccurring process that's been around since the beginning of time. I don't claim to be a physicist. I build houses for a living. But sometimes it takes an outside perspective to see something really obvious. If my theory turns out to be valid, not only will it explain global warming, but it'll help to predict long-term weather changes. I'm not saying that mankind is not accelerating the process of global warming. What I am saying is global warming would exist, with or without our help. The theory that I'm offering is simple, but the realization that led me to it is simpler yet. It was the realization that centrifugal force is not free. The first thing that any of us learned about physics were Sir Isaac Newton's three laws of motion. Only from my point of view, these laws of motion seemed to contradict what I was learning about centrifugal force. What confused me was, ever since I can remember, scientists have been proposing building huge space stations that were shaped like a wagon wheel or a cylinder that would spin, creating centrifugal force throwing things to their outer walls, creating a synthetic gravity. Well, that made sense to me. But then they went on to say that once they set these huge space stations into motion, that they'd continue turning forever. Their thinking was that since there was no friction or wind resistance to slow them down, they would just spin indefinitely, creating free centrifugal force. These scientists seem to be ignoring Newton's basic laws of motion. Newton makes it clear that if an object is in motion and it's deflected by another object, then every bit of energy that's lost to that deflection is accepted by the other object. It doesn't matter if it's deflected by a similar object or by the axis of an object that forces it into a circular path. Force is force and deflection is deflection. The best way I can think of to illustrate this point is with a ball on a string. When I spin the ball, centrifugal force throws it outward. But notice I have to keep whipping it, because the centrifugal force is draining the process of inertia or acceleration. Once I quit putting energy into the equation, you can see that it very quickly stops spinning. Is it because of wind resistance? Is it because of friction? No. Another good example of this is if you operate an aircraft or a motorcycle. When you go into a really tight bank, you have to give it extra throttle to make up for the inertia that you lose to centrifugal force. Centrifugal force is circular deflection. And it's only basic logic that if you want an object to experience one continuous g of circular deflection or centrifugal force, that an investment of one g of acceleration is going to be required. So, if scientists are still pondering the idea of building a space station that has one g of synthetic gravity, it's an awful lot of wasted energy. A 20,000 pound space station would require 20,000 pounds of force per second in order to maintain that 1G. Now if you took that kind of acceleration and applied it to a spaceship, you'd be accelerating at 32.2 feet per second. You would also have synthetic gravity, but you'd be going somewhere. So according to this principle, Space stations should quit spinning in a short period of time as they lose their rotational inertia to centrifugal force. But by the same token, the Earth should also quit spinning in a short period of time as it loses its rotational inertia to centrifugal force. And all satellites should lose their inertia to centrifugal force and therefore lose their orbit in a short time. But they don't. Why? But what about the guys that actually put satellites into orbit? They really have to know centrifugal force. Using Sir Isaac Newton's formulas that were created back in the 1600s, scientists are able to determine just how much force is necessary to launch a satellite into orbit. The thing is, is they've never had to consider the deceleration acting on their satellites as a result of centrifugal force. The deceleration still occurs. But there's a naturally occurring process that automatically replenishes the satellite's lost inertia. This process is gravitational oscillation. I'll say for the sake of this example that the Earth is traveling through space at 100 miles per hour. I'll say that the Moon is orbiting the Earth at the speed of 20 miles per hour. 
This would mean that on one leg of its orbit, the moon would be traveling 120 miles per hour, while on the opposite leg of the orbit, it would be traveling 80. What if the theory of relativity applied to a low-speed orbit? And when the moon increased its speed to 120 miles per hour, its gravity increased. And then when it slowed to 80, its gravity decreased. This would create a whipping motion that would overcome the inertia lost to centrifugal force. Now if this were the case, the satellite's orbit wouldn't be symmetrical, it wouldn't be circular, it would be offset and elliptical, which, as it turns out, all satellites' orbits are. Einstein established with the theory of relativity that when an object nears the speed of light, it becomes more dense, its gravity becomes more intense, time passes at a different rate, but he says that you can never pass or achieve the speed of light. He established that an object becomes so dense as it nears the speed of light that no amount of energy can push it past that point. Well, my question is, how close are we to that point? We know how fast the Earth is orbiting the Sun, and we have a pretty good idea of how fast the Sun is orbiting in the galaxy. But we have no idea how fast the galaxy is moving through the universe, or how fast the universe itself might be moving. I believe that the Earth and everything that we see is traveling very close to the speed of light right at that buffer zone in a very small window of existence. We're bumping up against that barrier to where we can't travel any faster, but what would happen if we tried slowing down? I believe if we saw an object decelerate from our current speed, that we'd notice it become larger and less dense and have less gravity until it got to the point eventually to where its density diminished to the point to where it couldn't hold its own atoms together. At that point, I think it would give up its material state and revert back to the state of pure energy from which it came. According to the theory of relativity, time accelerates relative to an object's speed. So therefore, everything that's measured by time is also relative to an object's speed. Things measured by time would include heat, light, gravity, and mass density. So as a satellite orbits an object that's traveling through space, its speed oscillates relative to the object that it's orbiting. Therefore, its time oscillates relative to the object it's orbiting. Since gravity is measured by time, and since the satellite's time oscillates relative to the object it's orbiting, so would its gravity. Sir Isaac Newton observed and documented the offset elliptical orbits of the planets around the Sun. From the time I first studied this, it brought to mind a question. If the Earth's one-year orbital path around the Sun is offset and elliptical, how can all 12 months be equal in length? It would appear that months like May would have a lot more days in them than months like November, but we know that's not true. Every month has approximately 30 days in it. And in my way of thinking, that would indicate that time changes in direct proportion to orbital speed. One more thing to consider. In the Earth's annual orbital path, in the months of June and July, the Earth is traveling much further from the Sun than it is during January and December. Well, it would only make sense that in the months of December and January that we'd experience a lot more heat and light from the Sun than we would during the months of June and July. But once again, that's not the way it is. In the course of a year, the average temperature at the equator only varies three degrees. And oddly enough, in January and December, where you'd expect it to be the warmest, it's the coolest. As a result of the theory of relativity, the heat and light we experience from the sun seems to be consistent year-round. For a clearer understanding of how the theory of relativity applies to heat, light, and orbital speed, let's have a look at pulsars. With a pulsar, you have two stars locked in each other's orbit traveling through space. One races ahead of the other while the other drops behind. Time is accelerated on the leading star as it slows down on the trailing star. What this means to us is that we would observe two seconds worth of light being emitted from the leading star for every one of our seconds that pass, while we only observe a half a second worth of light being emitted from the trailing star for every one of our seconds that pass. So my theory that relativity applies to orbital speed, and that time oscillates with orbital speed, is confirmed yet again with pulsars. In the course of a year, there are four significant alignments of the Earth, Moon, and Sun. There's the summer solstice, 
and the winter solstice where the Earth, Moon, and Sun are all lined up in the same direction of travel. And then there's the March and September equinox. These are a little more interesting. In the March equinox, the Earth and the Moon are traveling in exactly the opposite direction from the direction of the Sun. At this point, the Earth is traveling its lowest speed out of the entire year, which means the Moon is also traveling its lowest speed out of the entire year. On the flip side is September equinox. This is September 22nd and 23rd of every year. At this point, the Earth is traveling faster than the Sun, and the Moon is traveling faster than the Earth. This puts the Moon at its highest speed out of the entire year. Now my premise for this entire concept is that orbital speed affects gravity. Well, if that's true, then at this point, the Moon's gravity should be higher than any other time of the year. And there's one solid indicator that would reflect that, and those are the tides. It occurred to me that checking on the tide cycles could either make or break my theory. In order for my theory to be correct, I would have to find that the greatest fluctuation in tides would occur once a year on the third week of September. So I went online and I found this chart produced by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And you can see very clearly that their annual prediction of the highest tide fluctuation every year fell between the first week of September and the first week of October. Bingo! Exactly where I expected it to be. As it orbits the Sun, tracking the Earth's speed and direction as it travels through space is no easy task. The Earth travels in a zigzag pattern through space as its speed and direction varies relative to the Sun's. Then to make it even more difficult to track, next you have to consider the whipping factor. In the case of our solar orbit, when the Earth was traveling in the same direction as the Sun, it's traveling faster than the Sun. As its speed increases, so does its gravity, which causes it to be drawn towards the Sun with an even greater acceleration. This greater acceleration quickly becomes a greater deceleration as the Earth swings around the Sun. And as it's whipped around to a speed much slower than that of the Sun, its gravity becomes weaker relative to the Sun. And this causes it to swing wide on the backside of its orbit. It then shifts gears as it changes speed and direction as it's once again pulled forward by the gravity of the Sun. So in order to determine the Earth's true speed through space, you have to first know the Sun's true speed through space versus a fixed point in space. You have to consider the Earth's orbital speed, then you have to consider the variation in speed caused by its oscillating gravity. So with all factors considered, the Earth's speed would peak as it accelerates past the Sun. It would then quickly plummet as it was whipped around in the opposite direction. And finally, it would shift gears as it changed speed and direction as the Sun's gravity pulled it into its next orbit. This footprint doesn't just reflect the Earth's orbital speed. Since time, gravity, and mass density are all directly related to speed, it would reflect all those factors. What's more is this isn't just the Earth's orbital footprint. This is a universal orbital footprint of any satellite that's in orbit anywhere in the universe. And we can thank the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for producing such an accurate gravitational footprint of one Earth orbit. In order to predict future annual tide cycles, they averaged out the annual tide cycles between 1930 and 2006. By averaging out 76 years worth of annual tide cycles, they were able to eliminate any earthly influences on the tides. This produced a model that exclusively conveys the gravitational relationship between the Earth and the Sun during one Earth orbit. If this is indeed a universal orbital footprint, then one orbit of the Earth and one orbit of the Moon should reflect the same orbital footprint in the tides. This is a tidal record of one lunar orbit. It's kind of hard to tell from looking at this graph, but if you compress it and put it side by side looking at one Earth orbit, you can see the similarities. There's something I'd like to clarify about this theory. I'm saying that the Earth's gravity is much greater in September than it is in January. Only we can't perceive these changes from Earth's perspective, because along with Earth's speed, time and gravity change in exact proportion. This change in the Earth's gravity is only apparent from an outside perspective. 
which could be from the Sun or a static point in space. There is one way that you can observe that the Earth's gravity increases in the autumn with your naked eye, and that would be the annual occurrence of meteor showers. And if you check, the greatest occurrence of meteor showers would be in the autumn, when the Earth's speed and gravity are at their peak. At this time of year, the Earth's gravity reaches further out into the solar system than it does the rest of the year. This brings distant debris showering down on Earth over the next few months. And there's one more thing that you can observe with your naked eye that would confirm that the Earth's time increases with its speed during the winter months. Not only does gravity increase, but the Earth's magnetic fields increase. And this becomes very apparent with the increased visibility of the aurora borealis. The same principle that's responsible for the perpetual orbiting of satellites, planets, and stars is also responsible for their perpetual rotation. If we use the Earth for an example, we can see as it moves through space, half of it, because of its rotation, is moving faster than the Earth, while the other half is moving slower. As a result, time and gravity on half the Earth is more intense than on the other half. And this, responding to the Sun's gravity, causes the Earth to rotate. So what limits it from spinning faster and faster and faster until it finally flies apart? Fortunately, the Earth and everything else that rotates has a built-in governor. It's called centrifugal force. So once the gravity acting on the object's gravitational imbalance as a result of its rotational speed is equaled by the object's centrifugal force, its rotational speed will stabilize. Next, I would like to talk about the orbiting that takes place between the Moon and the Earth. Just like a pulsar, the Earth and Moon actually orbit each other. Of the total combined orbital mass between the Moon and Earth, the Earth accounts for 85% and the Moon 15%. So this means that 85% of the orbiting that we see is on the part of the Moon. The 15% of the orbit experienced by the Earth causes it to gently wobble from side to side and forward and back in its annual orbit. Now that I've established that orbital speed affects time and everything that's measured by it, you can appreciate that as the Earth orbits the Sun, even though very slightly, the action pulling it forward and back and side to side does affect its time and everything that's measured by it. The reason I bring this up is in our solar system, as the planets orbit the Sun, they also pull it gently forward and back and side to side. This affects the Sun's speed in its galactic orbit, as well as its time, density, and everything measured by time. These subtle changes in the Sun's galactic orbital speed may not be that dramatic, but they're significant enough to be reflected in long-term weather changes on Earth. It appears to me that at this time the Sun is increasing in speed and becoming more dense, but it's also increasing the average orbital speed of the Earth, which increases time and everything related to the Earth's speed, including gravity. It might just be that the reason we're seeing such an increase in carbon dioxide lately is that it's a heavier gas in the Earth's atmosphere. So as the Earth's gravity and mass density increase, we'll see gases compress where liquids and solids won't. So global warming and cooling are caused by the theory of relativity as the planets pull the Sun either faster or slower in its galactic orbit. So in order to predict future long-term weather changes, all we have to do is look back in history at past long-term weather patterns and compare those against the alignment of the planets. So over periods of thousands of years or tens of thousands of years, as the planets align in one direction or the other causing the Sun to speed or slow, we have periods of global warming and even on the other extreme ice ages. Considering the huge climatic changes on Earth that occur when the Sun slows and speeds as a result of planetary alignment, consider how tremendously the Earth's weather will change as the Sun speeds and slows in its galactic orbit. In our low speed solar orbit, you can see that the theory of relativity keeps gravity and mass density in direct proportion to the Earth's speed. But if you look at the evidence left behind on both Earth and Mars, during the course of a galactic orbit, gravity and mass density become disproportionate to speed. The most obvious proof of this would be on Mars, where there's recent evidence of water erosion. Consider the extremely small window at which rain can exist. 
Water can only exist in its liquid form between 32 degrees Fahrenheit and 130 degrees Fahrenheit with a barometric pressure of around 29.9 inches of mercury. For decades, scientists have proposed that once we settle Mars, that we could convert the atmosphere, which is primarily carbon dioxide, to one that has more oxygen in it by planting lots of vegetation. Even if we could change the composition of Mars's atmosphere, it would still have a barometric pressure that was equal to Earth's at an altitude of 100,000 feet. There's only one way that Mars could attain an atmosphere similar to ours on Earth, and that's if Mars's gravity increased by nearly twofold. Just like the Earth orbiting our Sun in the solar system, as the Sun orbits in the galaxy, it moves faster than the galaxy on one side of its orbit, while slower than the galaxy on the far side. And this causes our solar system's gravity and mass density to increase and decrease with every galactic orbit. So in the course of a galactic year, our solar system would experience four distinct seasons, summer, fall, winter, and spring. We can also see evidence of this here on Earth. During the galactic winter, when the Earth's gravity would be much lighter, evolution would allow Earth's inhabitants to grow to much larger sizes. And then as our solar system entered the galactic spring, Earth's gravity would become much more intense. It would make sense that the only large inhabitants of Earth to survive this increased gravity would be those that took to the water. And as our solar system passes from its galactic spring to summer, Mars will again attract an Earth-like rain-bearing atmosphere. But with our solar system's gravity having increased nearly twofold, imagine what life is like back on Earth. First of all, the Sun would increase nearly twofold in its density and gravity, which would make the Earth a very warm place. Water would become nearly twice as dense and heavy as today's water, and in the form of rain it would fall at nearly twice the velocity, which would have quite an erosive effect on the Earth. Also during our solar system's galactic summer, we'd notice more sediment on the Earth as a result of the Earth's increased gravity bringing in cosmic debris. With the Earth's increased heat, gravity, and mass density, it's likely that this is the period of time in which all organic sediment is compressed into oil and coal. Tectonic plates would be more mobile, new mountain ranges would be formed, some life would survive, but the Earth would not be a very pleasant place to live in this period of time. The good news is, if we decide to set out our solar system's galactic summer, go someplace where it's cooler and more pleasant, by then Mars would have developed an Earth-like rain-bearing atmosphere, and by then we will have certainly develop the technology to go there. I think everybody's first question to this theory would be the same as mine. If it's all that simple, why didn't somebody else come up with it first? Well, I think the truth of the matter is, is it's hard to get a new idea accepted. Other people probably did come up with it first. As a matter of fact, I came up with this theory when I was about 24 years old myself. My first book was published when I was 21. At 24, I went on to write a science fiction novel called New Atlantis. I don't know about you, but it just bugs the heck out of me to read science fiction that's not feasible. While I was drafting the novel, it was a consideration of spaceships and space travel that started me thinking along these lines. I ironed out the theory in about 1984, and in that same year I caught an episode of Nova that pertained to it. In this episode, a Dr. Walter Alvarez of Berkeley was asking the question of why Earth goes through such dramatic changes and regular intervals. Intervals that, among other things, eliminated the dinosaurs. So I quickly drafted a four-page letter entitled The Course of a Galactic Year and sent it off time. A short time later I received it back from him with a posted note in which he said he can't comment on my theory because he's not an astrophysicist. So next I sent it to Omni Magazine hoping that someone could either embrace or disprove it. But instead, I got it back with a letter saying that their staff editors weren't scientists and they couldn't evaluate it either. So I approached several colleges and I always got the same response. They said that I had to prove my theory. Well, how do you prove something like this? Well, that was 25 years ago. 
I didn't give the theory much more thought until just recently. I build houses for a living, and with the market the way it is, I had to take a project on that's 50 miles north of where I live. My 100 mile a day commute is along a corridor where traffic is just horrible. I'd spend the average of four hours a day sitting in traffic. With all this time on my hands, I decided to start considering what proof I could come up with to support my theory. And that proof is contained in this video.